Shri Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swamiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Tarubischa Kripa Sindhu Devaja Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadad Har Srivasavi Gaur Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <clears throat> So today we'll do a verse which was somewhat in the sequence of verses that we did a few days ago on the topic of suffering with Maharaj Parikshit coming across the uh, scene of a low class man beating the uh, legs of a bull and the bull, bull's three legs were broken and one leg was still standing Alongside of the bull, there was a cow, and the cow was in complete distress. Um, these are analogous. The bull represents religion, and the cow represents Mother Earth. Hmm. It's also quite interesting and both indicative to understand that religious principles are uh, coming in three factors of themselves. In other words, the society is considered to be progressive or established in three aspects. One is that people are taught to and to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead and are guided by qualified spiritual teachers. Two, society is, um, follows the principles of Brahminical culture and those qualities that are of the mode of goodness and which are supportive of the whole aspect or the whole process of Bhakti Yoga. And the third is cow protection, which also includes the bull. The bull being the principle of religion, the cow being the principle of stability, earth. And both contribute to the needs of society and the development of society. Um, we'll take one verse today and then starting tomorrow, we'll begin a series of talks to introduce some of the principles that are in the mode of goodness and also these are some of these are also religious principles characteristics of qualities but we hope to continue that for a number of days and then lead into the subject of van ashram uh, the four varnas and the four ashrams and the, and the vision of the great souls, especially his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, in establishing simple living and farm communities as the, as the foundation for creating a, a society that is conducive to the needs of the human being and for the progression of spiritual life. So um, today we'll do this one verse, which is from the first canto. Uh, 
17th chapter, verse number 24. So if our, uh, our host could bring it up, 1, 17, 24. Thank you. Okay. Yep. So this is in sequence of the past time where the Maharaj Pariksit comes across the bull and asks the bull what is the cause of suffering. After concluding that the cause of suffering is cannot be discerned simply by philosophical uh, speculation, but is understood in relationship to one's activities. And of course, suffering comes in three forms also. Sufferings come by having a material body. The body causes suffering, the mind causes suffering. The living entities in the environment also, around surrounding us also cause us suffering. Lower living entities, also living entities on higher stages and even living entities on the same level as we are. And then of course, uh, the devas, the empowered uh, personalities who are in charge of the material energies or the material functions of, of the world, such as uh, rain, heat, cold, and all of the uh, resultant activities that come by the way of the extremes or the lack of of the higher powers. In other words, too much heat, too much cold, uh, floods, uh, forest fires, you, you name it, pestilence. We got that right now. These are all introduced to us by higher powers. Okay, so now we'll speak about the four regulative principles that the devotees have accepted as their way of foundation against material sin sinful activities and what destroys these four things. So if we can read the verse, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Tapa Saucham Dayama Daya Satyam, Kriti Prada Kriti Kritayaha. Adharma Sais Trayo Bhagna Shama Sangha Madhaistava. Translation In the age, oops, in the age of truthfulness, Satya Yuga, your four legs were established by the four principles of austerity, cleanliness, mercifulness, mercy, and truthfulness. But it appears that three of your legs are broken due to rampart religion in the form of pride, lust for women, intoxication. So you notice that of the four legs, three are broken. Okay. So what is that leg that remains? Truthfulness. Okay. Purport. The deluding energy of material nature can act upon the living beings. Uh, actually, we would like to... Uh, Enlist someone who is really enthusiastic and is good to read the purport. We'll find someone out there in Cyberland who is enthusiastic and likes to read. Guru Maharaj, may I read? Clearly. Okay. The deluding energy or material nature can act upon the living beings proportionately in terms of the living beings falling prey to the deluding attraction of Maya. Moths are captivated 
by the glaring brightness of light, and thus they become prey to the fire. Similarly, the deluding energy is always captivating the conditions to become prey to the fire of delusion, and the Vedic scriptures warn the conditioned souls not to become prey to delusion, but to get rid of it. The Vedas warn us to, not, to go not to the darkness of ignorance, but to the progressive path of light. The Lord himself also warns that the deluding power of material energy is too powerful to overcome. But one who completely surrenders unto the Lord can easily do so. But to surrender unto the lotus feet of the Lord is also not very easy. Such surrender is possible by persons of austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness. These four principles of advanced civilization were remarkable features in the age of Satya. In that age, every human being was practically a qualified Brahmana of the highest order. And in the social orders of life, they were all Paramahamsas or the topmost in the renounced order. By cultural standing, the human beings were not at all subjected to the deluding energy. Such strong men of character were competent enough to get away from the clutches of Maya. But gradually, as the basic principles of Brahmanic culture, namely austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness, became curtailed by proportionate development of pride, attachment for women, and intoxication, the path of salvation or the path of transcendental bliss retreated far, far away from human society. With the progression of the age of Kali, people are becoming very proud and attached to women and intoxication. By the influence of the age of Kali, even a pauper is proud of his penny. The women are always dressed in an overly attractive fashion to victimize the minds of men. And the man is addicted to drinking wine, smoking, drinking tea, and chewing tobacco, etc. All these habits or so-called advancement of civilization are the root causes of all irreligiosities. And therefore, it is not possible to check corruption, bribery, and nepotism. Man cannot check all these evils simply by statutory acts and police vigilance. But he can cure the disease of the mind by the proper medicine, namely advocating the principles of Brahminical culture or the principles of austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness. Modern civilization and economic development are creating a new situation of poverty and scarcity with the result of blackmailing the consumer's commodities. If the leaders and the rich men of the society spend 50% of their accumulated wealth mercifully for the misled mass of people and educate them in God consciousness, the knowledge of Bhagavatam, certainly the age of Kali will be defeated in its attempt to entrap the conditioned souls. We must always remember that false pride or too high an estimation of one's own values of life, undue attachment to women, or association with them and intoxication will divert human civilization from the path of peace, however much the people clamor for peace in the world. The teaching of the Bhagavatam principles will automatically render all men 
austere, clean, both inside and outside, merciful to the suffering and truthful in daily behavior. That is the way of correcting the flaws of human society, which are very prominently exhibited at the present moment. Thank you. Namaste, sirs, what the Devi Gauravani Pachari Nani receives as soon you value Pastyat Nidhi Sitarani. So we get a little bit of a glimpse through these words of wisdom of where present civilization is and where and how it's heading in the same direction. And therefore, people are, as it says here, people are not happy and there can be no correction to these anomalies in life simply by legislation and police vill villages. It can only be done by transforming a person's consciousness towards the qualities that counteract these, um, what we say, four sinful activities. What are the four sinful activities? When the devotees enter into the process of Krishna consciousness, along with vowing daily to chant 16 rounds on beads every day, they also agree to follow four principles. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, and no gambling. These four sinful activities align themselves with the four principles of religion, such as cleanliness, austerity, mercifulness, and truthfulness. Um, illicit sex destroys cleanliness. Intoxication destroys austerity. Meat-eating destroys mercifulness and gambling or lying propaganda destroys truthfulness. Now we learn from this text and also we also see that in this age these cleanliness, austerity, mercifulness are pretty much gone within human society. Um, people don't accept any kind of austerity. The only austerity we find that people engage in is when politicians have to, uh, you know, pledge for office or to uh, campaign for office. They perform all kinds of austerities, give up their personal needs, and go in and go on a, uh, you know, political tour of the, of the society in order to get votes. Therefore, they give up their comforts, they give up a lot of their normal in order to get elected. So that's austerity in the mode of ignorance. So it's not really considered to be austerity because it doesn't bring anyone to a higher state of consciousness, which austerity is meant to do. Austerity means to accept some difficulty to get off the bodily platform and onto the spiritual platform, such as bathing early in the morning and bathing at least twice a day. Um, that is one of the principles of human life, to cleanse oneself through bathing at least twice a day, um, keeping oneself, what we say, regulated in their activities of devotion and also in their day-to-day -day activities within the society. Um, austerity uh, comes in different forms of itself. Um, austerity means to speak truthfully and beneficially. Austerity means to practice uh, satisfaction. Austerity means to practice cleanliness and nonviolence. Um, 
It also means to um, uh, to be satisfied with whatever the Lord arranges by one's what we say natural endeavor, not excessively endeavoring for material things that breaks the principle of austerity. So austerity is pretty much absence in this age, but the bodhis have been taught that this is required in order to make advancement on the path of devotional service because it supports the main principles which are chanting the holy names of the Lord, hearing the glories of the Lord, uh, serving in various capacities according to the nine angas or limbs of bhakti, and of course, uh, worshiping the Lord in his deity form. And of course, accepting only those foodstuffs that are offered to the Lord in devotion and refraining from food that is not, not offered to the Lord. So there are many austerities. Sometimes we say that austerity is the wealth of the Brahmin class. We also say austerity itself is wealth because by austerity, one develops knowledge and by knowledge, one can traverse the path of bhakti with the, with the proper understanding. Austerity is required in this age. There is no austerity. In fact, one of the reasons why people get sick in this age so easily, you see, aside from this particular epidemic we have, even before then, or even, and just in general, people don't follow any, any pattern of life. They eat when they want, they sleep when they want, they have sex whenever they are inclined to. So this, uh, this living according to the pushings of the senses is a form of animal existence, but at the same time, it destroys one's health. That's why people are not strong in this age. They're not healthy in this age. They're not truthful in this age because they follow no rules and regulations. Just to uh, divert my attention to an example, um, I'll give you a practical example of something that is just within my purview. I'm living in a particular building and this is real, real close to the temple. But across the street from me, just directly across the street, and the streets are very narrow here, there is a house and in that house, people stay up to about one and two o'clock in the morning watching television. <laughs> They turn on their television like around nine o'clock at night or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what they watch. I don't see anything. But they have their television going on to one and two in the morning. Sometimes I wake up and I see still the flashing of the lights from the television coming through my window. And this is on both, this, both floors of this house next to me. People are addicted to staying and watching these, you know, whatever they watch. They don't follow any rules. And then, of course, they go to bed like around two or three in the morning and then they sleep the whole morning. So this is, this has nothing to do with decent human life. And one is simply destroying their health and their, of course, their mental their abilities to reason. And to think clearly is simply fueled by whatever they see on the media. That's all. Cleanliness. Um, so austerity is destroyed by intoxication. So that's why we say no intoxication. That means no cigarettes, no, no alcohol, 
no chewing tobacco, as Prabhupada says, no, uh, no coffee and no tea are those ingredients such as caffeine, which is an intoxicate. Intoxication, people get addicted to coffee, they get addicted to tea. So that's considered, these things are restricted for the one who wants to seriously practice Krishna consciousness. Cleanliness is both external and internal. Uh, external cleanliness means to keep the body clean by washing it regularly. And uh, even after using the toilet, uh, one should bathe especially if they're, if they're doing any kinds of form of work, worshiping the deities or cooking or anything like that. It's unclean to go to the bathroom and then not bathe afterwards. Of course, for, for, that's for evacuation, of course. Um, and there are rules and regulations to help keep cleanliness as a standard. Um, Keeping the mind clean means to chant the holy name of the Lord and to hear the glories of the Lord. That's internal cleanliness. But we're speaking here about external cleanliness. Another one is to engage in sexual activities against the principles of religion. And that also is the feature of uncleanliness and, and it can cause diseases. And it could also, uh, cause uh, many, many other problems. So external cleanliness means to follow the principles of sexual activity for the procreation of children within marriage and not otherwise. Of course, there are more, there are more rules and regulations that are applied to that. I won't go into that because these are details that one should search out through Prabhupada's instructions and in the books on how to engage in proper sexual activities according to religious principles. Uh, the next one is mercy. Mercy is destroyed by uh, um, animal killing, the killing of animals. And therefore we say no, uh, no meat eating. And therefore, even if you don't physically kill the animal, if you eat meat, you contribute to killing. And therefore, you're also destroying the principle of mercifulness. Therefore, animals are not meant to be killed simply to satisfy the, the tongue of people in society. Animals have their place within society and they provide something for society according to the different types of animals like that. Every animal has a purpose. It's not that they're just here as pets or to be exploited by us. Uh, mercy is also destroyed by, um, by too, much, uh, too much engagement in sense gratification, destroys one's ability to become merciful. One becomes absorbed in satisfying the senses and cannot take time or even see the need to be kind in, to others. Prabhupada would also say that when he came to the United States of America, he was shocked, he had heard, and he, uh, that was sometimes people in broad daylight would be, someone would be attacked by another person and no one would come along to assist or do anything and that other person will be victimized by some cruelty in public. So people's ability of mercifulness is reduced in this age dramatic, dra dr dramatically or drastically. And truthfulness, truthfulness means to speak truthfully and beneficially, avoid speech that offends and to regularly quote authorities such as Shastra, Guru, and the teachers that have gone before us, that is truthfulness. 
Truthfulness still remains in this age to some degree. You might say austerity, cleanliness, and mercifulness is practically gone. And this is described in this series of verses. But truthfulness still remains because Shastra is still there. Uh, those who practice spiritual life are still there. Um, in other words, truthfulness still has some leg to stand on in this age. But this is being gradually destroyed by lying propaganda. We can actually rightfully say without being uh, what we say a critical that you turn on the news today and you hear various things. How truthful they are is questionable uh, because it's all from a certain angle of vision that they present these things with an idea to get a certain point across. Or the things that should be said are not being said and the things that should not be said are being said. So truthfulness is duplicity, hypocrisy, lying, cheating, uh, deceitfulness, nepotism. These are all ways that truthfulness is being attacked in this age. Therefore, uh, because the devotees of the world, not just devotees in ISKCON, but those who are truly religious persons, truth still remains to some degree but it's gradually being eroded away by untruthfulness. There's an interesting publication authored by one of our senior devotees, His, His Holiness Sacharup Maharaj. And he's wrote, he wrote a book called Truth, Truthfulness. And he, explain, he explores this subject matter in detail. If somebody has the knowledge they can post the title of that book it's by Sad Sarup Maharaj it's been circulating within ISKCON library circles for the last 30 years it's a great book I think I'm not sure of the exact title but the word truth is within the title so maybe someone can explore it and put it up on the uh, on the chat, and we can, and then also how one may obtain it. I found it extremely interesting, unique in uncovering some really interesting principles that are the foundation for truthfulness. Also describing what is not truthfulness. Okay, so these uh, four principles of religion, three of them are practically gone. So that's why devotees are very much, uh, uh, what we say, instructed to follow these four things, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, and no gambling. Because as Srila Prabhupada has repeatedly said, these four activities are the pillars of all sinful activities. If one follows, one restrains or refrains from these four activities, then one can be free from all reactions of all sinful activities. Okay, so, um, but of course, well, I'll just end with a little antidote where uh, when one of Srila Prabhupada's god brothers had traveled to London to preach Krishna consciousness, he came in contact with one very respectable Lord. And the Lord became quite favorable to what this devotee was preaching. And he said to the devotee, can you make me a Brahmana? And the devotee said, yes. We can make you a Brahma. You must simply follow these four principles. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. And the response, of the, the response from the Lord was, this is impossible. 
These are the ways that we live. In other words, these things go on as normal within today's present society. Gambling, cheating, lying, killing of animals, illicit sex, intoxication, and various other forms of sinful activities are publicized and broadcast as ways of entertainment and ways of making progress in life. So we see we're in a very difficult time within the world. Of course, this is, these are characteristics of this particular age of Kali. Therefore, devotees have to stay very strict in following these four principles and very strict in chanting every day their 16 rounds on beads. And that way they'll be free from the effects of Kali Yuga. Not free, but completely free from the effects of Kali Yuga. Okay, so we'll stop there and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for a wonderful um, detailed explanation on the four principles of religion. It's very important actually to remind us all the time of those four religions, uh, principles basically. Uh, devotees, if you have any realization and reflections, comments, please unmute yourself or um, you can type it in the chat box and I'll read it out for you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. While we're waiting for questions, I'll be right back. We have to do something onto the altar here. Mm -hmm. Sure, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna Lavanya Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. All glory to you, sir, Maharaj. Um, uh, I have a question um, with regard to onion and garlic because um, when you were mentioning in regard, about in the, onion and garlic. Onion and garlic, okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, uh, we can classify uh, caffeine with intoxication, the so tea and uh, coffee and all that. Um, but how do we relate onion and garlic? Because with onion and garlic, we always relate them to the mode of passion and ignorance that increases. But uh, we don't relate them directly to these four pillars of religion, which is truthfulness, mercy, um cleanliness and um the fourth one is i forgot yeah yes yeah so we we when we actually extend we give abbreviated statement with with meat eating we say no meat no fish no eggs no onion no garlic so that's the whole statement so that's there in the that's actually there in the uh, in the shastras. So these things are also included. We just give abbreviated statement by saying no meat eating, but it includes no meat, no fish, no eggs, no onions, no garlic. So that's there. Okay. Yeah, it's included, but sometimes we don't mention it, but. We should, because maybe not everyone's aware of this fact, yeah. So then it relates to mercy, right? No, it's, it's in, in, yeah, everybody relates to mercy, yeah, in that sense. Yeah, you're destroying your own body by these things. 
Some people will consider these health items, but actually when you delve deeply, you find that, well, there's, there's statements by, the, by both the Shastras and by, by the spiritual teachers on the detrimental effects on health on these things. Of course, people will say, well, garlic is very good for the health. But there's, other, there's other surveys that show that actually it is, it is not really true. <laughs> Sometimes it's used as a health item. Of course, in certain rare cases where the doctor prescribes some garlic as part of the medicine, it's not, it doesn't break the principles if one does that for health reasons. But generally, just garlic in food items really doesn't really... Uh, is really is meant to be refrained from because it's, and I have a whole report on that if anybody's interested in that. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would be interested, Mara, because um, when speaking in family, it's very hard to convince them why we don't eat any of garlic. We give the story of uh, Rahu and Ketu, you know, the blood falling, and from there, the onion and garlic growing, it doesn't go into their mind. It doesn't fit somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. They don't count it as being cruel because it's something related to food. And with food, we generally say you have to eat everything, you know, which, which is um, where you're not being unfair to other animals, other beings. Somehow they don't relate because uh, we say that we can be vegetarian, we can eat vegetation. We just don't eat meat. And then, so then they just keep arguing. So it, I think it would be helpful if you share um, the document that you have. I'll, ex I'll expand on that a little bit right now by saying that these food, as you mentioned, are in the modes of passion and ignorance. And therefore, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita in the 17th chapter describes that one should eat foods only in the mode of goodness. And then it says milk, milk products, legumes, um, vegetables, fruits like that. These things are in the mode of goodness. So there are foods in the mode of goodness, foods in the mode of passion, and foods in the mode of ignorance. So onions and garlic fall in the lower modes. And therefore, one, if one wants to practice spiritual life, one should refrain from these things. Um, Maya, also, I'm going to, um, sorry, sorry, please go No, ahead. I was just going to add one thing, just like it's also mentioned in the, the uh, instructions, and tamarind is also a form of intoxication, slight, but if one becomes eating tamarind regularly, uh, Prabhupada writes in the purport that one should refrain from that because that is also a, a form of intoxication. He also mentioned, also mentions uh, what is called Masur Dal. You know what Masur Dal is? Masur Dal is lentils, I think. The red yeah, lentils. Yeah, yeah they're very lentils. high. Yeah, red, they're very high in protein. And therefore, one wants to control the mind and senses. One should refrain from the sur dal. You can eat, you can eat uh, chana dal. You can have mung dal. You can have what is that other dal? Uh, ur dal. The sur dal is is is, uh, is to we're told not to engage in that. So there are foods that are not very conducive to one's consciousness in order for one to practice spiritual life, they affect the consciousness in a negative way. So this is extending the principle a little bit in the area of eating, not only meat, also in Prabhupada also writes foods that are very high in protein 
are also considered to be non-veg. <laughs> That's like soya as well? Like what? Um, soya, I have heard that soya has also been categorized as very high, high in protein. And that's why I have not heard myself any lecture, but I have heard devotees saying that, um, you know, some sannyasis, they do classify soya as well in, in um, meat because it's very, very high in protein. Yeah. I... As soon as one time I went to someone's house for lunch and they gave me some, and after a while I felt really terrible. Uh, after that, I never took it again. And I think before then I hardly ever tasted it. And so it's, it, it, it just gave me a very bad reaction. So uh, yeah, so I, I, I would say that yeah, and if you really want to practice Krishna spiritual life properly, you should re, you should eat accordingly. We have so much nice foods that we can make. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of preparations with a combination of all the basic ingredients that are in the mode of goodness and that we can delve in. These other things that stimulate the senses, they also stimulate passion also. Kumara, just to conclude my own understanding, um, as I understand you're saying that obviously onion and garlic is the extended form when we are trying to say it to somebody, um, you know, for eating, not eating meat, and then we can extend it. And sometimes we get, uh, sometimes we get arguments like, so this is for my own understanding also, that, you know, we find in our devotee circles, people eating soya, people eating cheese, people eating, I, I mean, we also eat cheese, uh, chocolate and all that. So when, when we come across these kind of arguments, whether it is from devotees or from non-devotees, to, um, to make our own understanding strong and also because I have kids, to make their understanding strong because we are trying to follow um, uh, more because we want to progress in our in our spiritual life. Uh -huh. We are trying to avoid as many things in mode of ignorance and passion. And then we see outside world and devotees uh, consuming certain things. We ourselves also consume, um, like cheese uh -huh. we eat. So how do we explain what's the justification that can be given to kids or to ourselves as well when we are questioned by others? Well, you know, the society is pushing these things as normal and people can't see anything wrong with it. But if you, you know, what you eat also affects your consciousness. Of course, we should eat prasadam. But Krishna explains, I can give that, that verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Foods in the mode of passion, foods in the mode of ignorance, foods in the mode of goodness. And therefore, it says that foods only in the mode of goodness can be offered to Krishna, not foods in the mode of passion and ignorance. So from the spiritual perspective, we follow what pleases Krishna. We can't just offer anything to Krishna and call it, uh, you know, prasadam. We have to offer what Krishna wants. So he tells us not to offer these food, these other foods. That's from the spiritual perspective. Like that. Chocolate, chocolate is a slight aphrodisiac. And eating too much chocolate, and you, you will also be affected by that. Tamarind is the same thing. I, cheeses that have retinin, retina, what is it, retina? What is it called? Rennet. Rennet. Yeah, that's cheese that has meat products in it. So they, that's highly, how do you know which cheese? If you're going to eat cheese, eat cheese that's coming from our farms, made from our cows, like that. Uh, that cheese is okay. Mm. But then again, not, not too much also. So you are what you eat. Sometimes we say that. 
what what you eat will affect your consciousness. There's no question about that. We all know that. If you eat too much sugar, you'll have a hard time controlling your senses. If you eat too much, you fall into the modes of passion and ignorance. If you eat too little, you can't maintain your, your consciousness in devotional service. So eating is a very supportive part of our Krishna conscious practice. Mm -hmm. That's why we're very strict in our temples, who can cook and what we offer to the Lord. Not only does it have to be prepared to be the right ingredients, the persons who cook have to be in the best of all consciousness because it's being offered to Krishna. That's why it said, that's why the standard for cooking in our temples is Brahminical initiation. That is the actual standard Prabhupada established. And Prabhupada established as far as uh, cooking, he said only ghee. He didn't want us to use all these other different ingredients, these different kinds of oils. He said, ghee is healthy. Ghee is in the mode of goodness. Of course, not too much. It's not like that. So yeah, there's a lot of considerations, both in cooking and in the ingredients and in eating that are very much important in developing the proper consciousness. If we eat food cooked by the non devotees, then your consciousness will immediately go down and the, the, the symptoms you will experience is that you will find it very hard to chant japa when you start eating foods by non-devotees. It disturbs the mind too much. So Thank yeah, there's you. a lot to it. Yeah. Yeah, very hard to control the tongue, Maharaj. <laughs> That's why you yeah, it's the whole thing. Yeah. But yeah. We, we can eat nice tasting foods when there's so many things that are fall into that category that we can make nicely. Indian cuisine has a very, a large variety of items that are acceptable and can be offered like that. Healthy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to stick to the Indian traditional cooking, but uh, I have just seen that the more uh, we buy, I mean, we as in our, we as family, we buy more things from the store, um, the more possibility of getting food in the mode of passion or ignorance, because they have made the simple definition that I have come about is just try and avoid buying anything from supermarkets because either they'll be pre-cooked or they'll be sitting there for a long, long time. So basically just buy everything raw and then make whatever you can. I can even take it another step farther. Prabhupada says that in, 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 in Vedic times, especially for those families that, that, were, that were somewhat aristocratic, they would never buy powdered spices. Never. They would only get fresh whole spices and grind their own spices up. And those spices were so full of nutrition and very healthy and increases the quality of the taste of the food tremendously. These powdered spices we buy, they're mixed with, um, we're mixed with uh, sometimes wheat powder and different kinds of other things like that. And they're sitting on the shelves for a long time. They lose their potency. I know devotees who, who get by only whole spices and then they, they grind them themselves. That, if you can start doing that, then your children will not run around looking for other things because the food will be so tasty. Yeah, yeah, Maharaj, I have been doing that for a few years now. I ground my own spices. I don't bring anything from outside. Good, Basically. good. That's, that's um, really, that's first quality, that's first class quality, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously we were, from the very beginning, we were um, very um, 
close to the Indian cooking, my family. But yeah, now we have been grinding it on my own. But yeah, it takes time, you know, it takes time, it takes energy. Uh, but yeah, we have to pick and choose to develop our consciousness, as you said. Yeah, but the time you put into it is worth it because when you don't do that, you're actually taking a chance with your health. You eat properly, and health is based on three principles generally. Or we might say four. One, proper diet, and of course, balanced, and at the same time, not too much, not too little. Two, uh, exercise. One should exercise regularly according to one's needs. Three, fresh air. These things, we don't get fresh air anymore. We get this smog. And we live in this, we live in these apartments during the winter time. We stay free from the fresh air on the outside. And if we go outside, the air is freezing anyway, and it's just polluted. The oxygen level within the within the environment is decreasing gradually by all this pollution thrown into the atmosphere. So these three things, fresh air, um, proper diet and uh, good exercise are the foundations for keeping good health. And following a, a regulated schedule of hygiene, which is also, all these things are also part of that schedule. Prabhupada covers this. He speaks about this in his purports. He mentions it in his books and in his lectures. Prabhupada was very keen on making sure devotees keep good health. More so than any of the previous acharyas, he emphasized that devotees should do whatever is necessary to keep good health, and he also gave prescriptions for that. Radhananda Maharaj has uh, compiled a book about many of the quotes that Srila Prabhupada has made on health. And uh, it's an interesting book. It's available. You can get it. It's recent, it was released within the last two years. Um, uh, it's the way the title of the book is um, the statement that Prabhupada used to use at the end of every letter. Hope this meets you in the best of health. Your ever well wisher, AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami. Mm -hmm. That's how Prabhupada signed practically all his letters. <laughs> he was always concerned to develop devotees keep good health so they could re remain strong and execute devotional service to, to their full capacity. So eating is a big part of that. If we eat just for taste, and we will get sick. We have to eat. Food should taste nice and also should be healthy. Can someone bring up that purport from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 17, verses 8 through 10? Sure, Guru Maharaj. We'll give you a little example of this is the Bhagavad Gita. This is Krishna speaking. Okay. Well, verses 8 through 12. Uh, this is verse 17.8, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, let's see. Let me go down the page. Let me see. Okay, there's no purple, right? No, Guru Maharaj. Go down, go down, go to the next verse. Let's see. Yeah, okay, and the next verse. Okay, so yes. All right, so okay, now go back to the first one again, number eight.
Okay, Krishna is speaking now. Foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life, purify one's existence and give strength, health, happiness, satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, pleasing to the heart. Next verse. Foods that are too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning are dear to those in the mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. Next. Foods prepared more than three hours before eating that is tasteless, decomposed, and putrefied. And food consisting of remnants of untouchable things are dear to those in the mode of uh, darkness. Okay, someone want, someone read the purport? Devotees, someone like to read the purport? I can read the purport. Thank you, Mataji. Okay. The purpose of food is to increase the duration of life, purify the mind, and aid bodily strength. This is its only purpose. In the past, great authorities selected those foods that best aid health and increase life's duration, such as milk products, sugar, rice, wheat, fruits, and vegetables. These foods are very dear to those in the mode of goodness. Some other foods, such as baked corn and molasses, while not very palatable in themselves, can be made pleasant when mixed with milk or other foods. They are then in the mode of goodness. All these foods are pure by nature. They are quite distinct from untouchable things like meat and liquor. Fatty foods, as mentioned in the eighth verse, have no connection with animal fat obtained by slaughter. Animal fat is available in the form of milk, which is the most wonderful of all foods. Milk, butter, cheese, and similar products give animal fat in a form which rules out any need for the killing of innocent creatures. It is only through brute mentality that this killing goes on. The civilized method of obtaining needed fat is by milk. Slaughter is the way of subhumans. Protein is amply available through split peas, dal, whole wheat, etc. Foods in the mode of passion, which are bitter, too salty, or too hot, or overly mixed with red pepper, cause misery by reducing the mucus in the stomach, leading to disease. Foods in the mode of ignorance or darkness are essentially those that are not fresh. Any food cooked more than three hours before it is eaten, except prashadam, food offered to the Lord, is considered to be in the mode of darkness. Because they are decomposing, such foods give a bad odor, which often attracts people in this mode, but repulses those in the mode of goodness. Remnants of food may be eaten only when they are part of a meal that was first offered to the Supreme Lord or first eaten by saintly persons, especially the spiritual master. Otherwise, the remnants of food are considered to be in the mode of darkness and they increase infection or disease. Such foodstuffs, although very palatable per, for persons, I'm sorry, to persons in the mode of darkness, are neither liked nor even touched by those in the mode of goodness. The best food is the remnants of what is offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Lord says that he accepts preparations of vegetables, flour, and milk when offered with devotion. Patram, pushpam, falam, toyam. Of course, devotion and love are the chief things which the Supreme Personality of Godhead accepts. But it is also mentioned that the prashadam should be prepared in a particular way. 
any food prepared by the injunctions of the scripture and offered to the supreme personality of Godhead can be taken even if prepared long, long ago, because such food is transcendental. Therefore, to make food antiseptic, eatable, and palatable for all persons, one should offer food to the supreme personality of Godhead. Thank you, Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah, so Krishna Prabhupada makes it clear what foods we should offer and how we should offer the foods and the benefits of that. <laughs> Prabhupada tells the story of how his god brothers went to uh, one country, which is now called My Myanmar. It was Burma in those days. He tells the story a few times in his lecture that uh, when the devotees came, they were cooking ghee. They were cooking and the smell of ghee was permeating the area. So people in the area were saying, oh, this is terrible. And they were, they were, you know, reacting to the smell of ghee. Of course, the devotees know the smell of ghee is very pleasant. But at the same time, that in this country, um, at least in this particular city, they have a, a festival once a year. And how do they prepare for that festival? They have a big iron bat that's in the middle of the city, huge, with a big lid on it. And any animal that dies, they throw it in the vat and it stays there the whole year and decomposes. And then after a year, they strain the juice off these decomposed animals and they use it as a condiment on their food. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about that. So, I mean, for devotees, that sounds really repugnant. And that's food and that's not even food in the mode of ignorance, below the mode of ignorance, but you see, how people in different cultures get attached to different kinds of food. Therefore, Krishna, who is above all cultures and above all designations, explains that food should be juicy, sweet, fatty. Uh, they support health and they should be in the category of milk products, vegetables, fruits, legumes, like that. So, I mean, Krishna really outlines how you should eat. <laughs> it's not like we're making up these things because we like to eat in a certain way and we like to tell people not to eat in a certain way. It's not. It's all based on Shastra coming from Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. I took a lot of time. I think there are many other questions, but thank you for clarifying and reinforcing. So I'll send you that thing. I'll send you that that thing on garlic if you are interested in it. Yes, I would definitely be interested in reading it. It's very helpful in preaching, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mansi Mataji. Uh, Guru Maharaj, we um, we have uh, two more questions from Janvi Mataji and Mohan Monakshi Mataji. Do you have time to take it? Uh, one says, I believe mushroom and vinegar are also in the lower modes. That's, that's also true. Vinegar is a putrefied fruit. Mushrooms, Prabhupada says, if cows eat mushrooms, they get sick. They, they, they're usually grown in dark places. Of course, people like mushrooms. And some of them are poisonous, too. They have a slight amount of you know, toxic uh, juice within them. So yeah, what is, what is the other thing? There is one from um, Janva Mataji. Uh, is it okay if I read it out? You want to read, Maharaj? Uh, go ahead, read. Yeah. Uh, so Janva Mataji is asking, uh, thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. I feel satisfied, but I have expectations. Expectations to develop de devotional service to the Lord. And there is another question from her. I have another question about Krishna consciousness standard. Are there high or low standard? How does it work the standard level? I don't know. Are there high and low standards? 
How does it work to standard level? I'm not sure what she means by standard. Krishna conscious standards, the standards are given in by the Shastras and by the Gurus. Standard means what to follow and what to avoid. Our standards are 16 rounds and four regulative principles. That's the standards by which we execute our devotional service. Those who are on that level, they're following. Those who are below that level, they're below the standard. And that's not a low standard, that's just below the standard. So there is the standard and below the standard. There's no high and low standard. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Janva Mataji, do you want to unmute yourself or are you happy with the answer? Yes, yeah, she's, she's okay. Uh, so there is one more question from uh, Mahakshini Mataji, uh, Mahakshini Mata, Radha Mataji. Hare Krishna, dear Guru Maharaj, how to develop truthfulness? If we catch us sometimes saying some kind of half-truth, how to change this attitude? If it is done in order to protect the others, maybe the other person can understand it in a wrong way and that cause misunderstanding. It may be between neighbors, boss and work or whatever relationships. Yeah, you might, if you see that it's causing some misunderstanding, you need to explain. It's called sophistry. Sophistry means half truth and half untruth. Like sometimes Prabhupada would use the example like when we preach, we go out and we say, my dear sir, you're, you're so intelligent, you're so qualified, you have so many good qualities. Uh, and then you're just flattering the guy. It's, you know, it's not true. You're just saying that. <laughs> and then you tell him, my dear sir, forget all these things that you know and chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and you'll, be, you'll actually develop real knowledge and happiness. So that's, that's, that's preaching tactics. So we sometimes we use these tactics in order to get people's attention, in order to give them just like uh, sometimes the, the mother will lie to the child in order to get the child to stop doing the wrong thing so she can get him to do the right thing. Oh, if you stop, um, you know, watching that stupid television program, I'll give you this nice sweet. She doesn't have any sweets, but he stops and think he's going to get a sweet and then she gives him something else. So that kind of half truth is can be used in a beneficial way, but it always has to be beneficial for the person. If it's not beneficial for the person, then it's not right, and then it's then then it's actually sophistry or, or lying. The doctor will tell you, you know, the doctor will tell you this medicine doesn't taste bad at all. Mm -hmm. But when you taste it, you think, oh my God, there's nothing worse than my, that I've ever tasted. But he's going to get you to get to take the medicine, that's all, somehow. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I'm Akshini Mataji. Do you have any other question? Do you want to unmute yourself? Who, who, you, who are you asking to unmute? This is Mohakshini Radha Mataji. Mohan, Mohanasini. Mohanash. Mohanasini Radha. Okay, she says thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Guru Maharaj, please may I ask a question? My humble obeisances to you all. Glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. On the subject of truthfulness, I would like to know the government just taxes and taxes. I mean, I'm not in the tax bracket or anything, but I'm just asking. We would make more contributions to ISKCON than pay uh, taxes to a government that supports abortion and does all kinds of horrible things. So if we say, no, I didn't earn so much money, I just earn half and give most of it to ISKCON, is that okay? I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> you have to decide. <laughs> I think 
need to hire a good tax attorney to help me there. I'm giving spiritual advice. I'm not going to give you advice on that level. Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you. You can talk to your friends and other persons who are more inclined to that type of lifestyle, then you can decide for yourself. No, I'm just outraged by how much they're taxing, you know, honest, ordinary folks who may just not even earn so much, but they're, and Trump gets away without paying any taxes. And then they support abortion, they support war, they do all kinds of things with the taxpayers' money. So I'm just like, okay. Did you, uh, did you have you read Bhagavatam? Bhagavatam says, as Kali Yuga goes on, taxes will only increase. And it'll get so bad that people will have to leave their dwellings and leave and go to another place to live. They said they will go to the forest. That's what it says. People, the government will tax you so bad. You just keep watching. It's going to, it's only going to increase. They come up with more and more taxes all the time. So it'll just, it's just Kali Yuga. That's all. What can you do? To, ex to expect them to be truthful and honest is, is like asking, you know, Harani Kasi Pu to, you know, to worship Lord Vishnu, you know. Mm. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, Governments just because are all, they're all, yeah, read the Bhagavatam. It tells you what the government leaders are made up of nowadays. And you don't need, the, you don't really need to read the Bhagavatam. You can see it for yourself. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I remember there Srila Prabhupada said the so-called leaders will become plunderers and looters. And Not become? What do you mean become? They are. Right. <laughs> it's like that's happening right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Why are you waiting for them to become? It's, this is the way it's a society is. Yeah, you can read the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. You'll get all the in information about you know, how we are governed by demoniac principles, not by religious principles or even moral principles. Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you. This is Kali Yuga. That's why Krishna consciousness is the only antidote for all this, all this craziness. Anything else? <laughs> Is there any other questions, devotees? Did anyone find that book by Satcharup Maharaj? Truthfulness? Oh, oh the, the, the I actually remember the title now, Truthfulness, The Last Leg of Religion is the name of the book. Truthfulness, The Last Leg of Religion. Uh, somebody could put it up on the chat so maybe devotees can get it. It's a really, really interesting explanation of this principle. Okay, so we'll stop here. And uh, um, Mansi, are you still there? Yes, Mara. I don't have I don't have your email, so I don't know how to how to send you anything. Yes, I have sent the email address to Lavanya Mataji yesterday. So. Um, Hopefully she can forward it to you. It's a common common email address between me and the fish, so it will help both of us. Well, I'll just I'll send I'll send a text to Mother Lavanya and then she can send it to you. Yes, sure, that's fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anjali and Sri Devi. Anjali has posted the 
the Amazon connection to truthfulness, the last leg of religion. Those who want to read an interesting treatise, it's not a very big book. It's quite small, but it's very, very informative. Okay, thank you very much. And I have to depart. So we'll see you all tomorrow. With um, We'll begin tomorrow with dealing with the principles that make up the foundation of, of an ashram dharma. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. This was so enlightening. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for your wonderful uh, association and the time. It was really amazing class today. Thank you. I'll end the call now, Thank devotees. You. Thank you. Thank Hare you, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.